Are you concerned about the denial of human rights, the growing use of surveillance or plastic waste in the ocean? I am passionate about the world we live in and reducing the problems that our world may face. But there is such an overwhelming complexity to these issues and people are often reluctant to take action. Where do we even start? I first began thinking about global issues at primary school when a group of us tried our hand at problem solving. While I cared about these issues and enjoyed thinking about these things, I didn't have the tools I needed to come up with ideas I felt could truly make a difference. I had no way of knowing whether we had fully considered our options or whether the solutions we came up with would adequately address the problem. And because I wasn't confident in these solutions, I lacked an important factor in creating action. Passion. It wasn't until I reached intermediate school that I was properly introduced to the Future Problem Solving Program. This is an international program which teaches students how to problem solve while fostering creative thinking. In this problem solving model, I found my passion for generating solutions to some of the world's global issues. And I'd like to share this passion with you. To do this, let's talk about something that's pretty close to home in Christchurch at the moment. Land transport. We rely on land transport for the trading of goods, getting from place to place, and connecting with others. What do you first think of when I talk about the issues facing land transport? This is Christchurch, so I'm guessing it's road cones. Or perhaps it's safety or congestion or the environmental impact of land transportation. But had you considered the economic impact of inadequate transport infrastructure? The American Society of Civil Engineers predicts that the United States could lose $3 trillion in gross national product if they don't improve their land transport infrastructure. New Zealand faces a similar fate. Like the United States, our land transport infrastructure is in need of a significant upgrade, and if we don't, our economy may be affected. This may be a problem because New Zealand is already in debt, not helped by the Christchurch earthquake and significant rebuild costs. I've just described a situation with many challenges. Land transport is big and complex, and there's no obvious starting point for how we should think about it. So the first step in the future problem-solving process isn't about solving the problem at all. It's about defining the problem. A team of four is challenged to consider problems from 16 different perspectives, like business and commerce, ethics, and physical health. And then from that much fuller consideration of our options, we can more confidently articulate an underlying problem. In the underlying problem, we identify the existing conditions we want to change. We then choose a significant action we want to take and explain why we want to do this. Parameters of time and place are added to ensure our best solutions will be possible within the identified time frame and appropriate location. This is the most important step to solving any problem. So the underlying problem in Christchurch's transport situation could be framed in this way. Because of significant congestion in the Christchurch transport system, how might we improve upon the time it takes to travel around Christchurch and the wider Christchurch region so that the very components of the New Zealand economy can be maximised? We now have a question we can try to answer. At this stage, a team will generate multiple solutions, all of which solve the underlying problem creatively. When we're considering solutions to big issues, people tend to look at what's been done before. But many times, this doesn't work. This may be a major reason why attempts to solve some of the world's biggest global issues haven't had the desired outcome. There is more value in tackling a situation from a unique angle than from the expected angle, and so each of our solutions takes a different perspective. Let me give you an example of what one of these solutions might look like. What if we had a system of driverless vehicle pods Let's call them V-pods, each with a one-person capacity capable of communicating with each other, with people, and with the infrastructure. The popular science magazine speculates that as vehicles become completely self-driving, 
Consumers may start to see them simply as automated taxis, and ownership will become less appealing. If vehicles weren't owned by individuals, we could reduce the number of vehicles we needed in our system hugely, since the average car spends around 90% of its lifetime parked. An individual could simply order a V-Pod, which would be dispatched from a nearby station and arrive at their door. Upon collection, the individual's destination could be programmed in and calibrated with all other journeys at this time. The purpose for this is so that in times of peak traffic, journeys could be sorted so that at different stages along the journey, their pods could connect together magnetically to form a road train known as platooning. This would do a number of things to improve transport in Christchurch. First of all, we would have less vehicles in the system, as not everyone uses a vehicle all the time. This would also help to reduce the huge problem of having a single person occupying a vehicle capable of transporting four or more people. We could travel safely in a smaller area due to the platooning ability of these vehicles, and we could travel at closer distances and faster speeds due to their communication abilities. Experts even predict that the use of autonomous vehicles could reduce car accidents by as much as 14%, maybe more. While this technology may seem a long way off, the technology we need actually already exists with Google's driverless cars. They still face a few challenges, but it is very real. In fact, one of the biggest things getting in the way of this technology is actually public acceptance. This is an example of just one solution we might have, but normally we would have 16, and so we need a way of deciding upon which solution to develop further. This step involves generating criteria against which we can analyze our solutions to decide upon the most effective solution to our problem. Which solution best reduces congestion in Christchurch? Which solution best improves upon the time it takes to travel around Christchurch and the wider Christchurch region? Which solution best allows the varied components of the New Zealand economy to be maximised? Which solution best accounts for the public acceptance of the technology used? These questions and others are all relevant to deciding upon the most effective solution to our problem. We are now at a point in our problem solving process where our problem seems a little more manageable, but we still haven't created action. After all, not all solutions can be implemented. The final step in the future problem solving process is to create a plan of action which fully explains how the creative, innovative, chosen solution will work and what needs to be done to make this happen. Believe it or not, I'm not actually here to provide you with the solution to transport in Christchurch. I'm here to share with you the importance of having a strategy to go about solving problems like this. A strategy like the future problem solving process can be scaled up or down to suit any problem. It could be the global issue of climate change, a more localised problem, like how the Christchurch City Council are going to spend their budget, or something as simple as what you're going to do on your holiday. One of my future problem solving coaches once told me that due to unforeseeable circumstances, she couldn't put the same amount of preparation into a university exam as she would have liked to. She got through the exam by using this framework to make creative links with the preparation she did have and applied it to the exam question. She passed with flying colours and maybe even did better than she would have with the normal preparation. As with anything, not one strategy suits everyone, so it doesn't really matter what your strategy is. The important thing is that you have a strategy and that it has arisen out of disciplined thought. We are moving out of the information age and into the conceptual age where creative thinking will become as essential as logical thinking when it comes to solving problems. The founder of Future Problem Solving, E. Paul Torrance, said we need to teach students how to think, not what to think. So many of the world's global issues seem overwhelming, but by having a strategic approach to go about solving them, this will eventually lead to significant change. I would love to leave you with a challenge to find your problem-solving strategy. If my generation can practice and learn to become collaborative, strategic, diverse problem-solvers, 
then maybe the global issues we face will become a little more manageable. Teach us to solve problems and we will tackle them ferociously. As Pearl Buck said, the young do not know enough to be prudent and therefore they attempt the impossible and achieve it generation after generation. Give us young people the tools and frameworks we need to attempt the impossible and watch what happens. Thank you.